Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Uh, a very good morning. You're most welcome to our Sunday morning worship here at St. Commonwealth. This is the third Sunday uh, of Easter. Uh, during the 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared again, risen to his disciples. Uh, and he had fellowship with them, ate with them many times, uh, and really revealed himself to them to encourage them in their ministry for what is ahead. And so we, we hope today, we pray that God, the risen Christ, will be someone who we experience uh, in our worship together. I'm going to ask us to stand uh, uh, before we read our, our singer opening hymn. I'll uh, say a few words on the screen. Let's stand. <laughs> Christ has been raised from the dead, and so, and so we can all be changed. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Pray as we stand, Lord Jesus Christ, risen from death and among us now. May you make yourself known to us in our worship, in the teaching of your word, and in the fellowship of your people and also in the breaking of the bread. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together now, uh, Rock of Ages. mix up on the, the slides there it can happen then again folks I have a few uh, announcements to share with you this morning uh, first thing to say is that Christ we had planned to open it uh, this month uh, but because Sunday school is closing really in a few weeks from now uh, it just seems uh, we decided just to leave it till September uh, so that it gives us enough time to get the we cabin in good uh, and better state as well uh, uh, so we're just going to leave it for that new uh, church season in September, Christ will be open uh, from then onwards. <coughs> to say our Ukraine appeal, uh, we managed to raise between both churches over £700 and just, just in this collection. Uh, I know that others have been donating directly online and also practically helping the cause as well, but you can continue to do that online, uh, that Bishop's Appeal Fund, so 
But we raised 700 just in our risk change among both churches, and that is now submitted uh, to the diocese. Also, our Bible studies are going to be up and running again soon this uh, Wednesday evening at uh, Port Malone Parish uh, Centre. Their, their Bible study is uh, in operation from this Wednesday onwards, 8 p.m. You can join in that as well and walk through the Bible. And our online Bible study will continue next Tuesday. That's Tuesday the 10th of May, the usual time, 7.30. Uh, so you'll be contacted uh, about that. Our Youth Fellowship as well begins again uh, after Easter now on the 15th of May. Uh, Jen's going to be coming to speak on a study even about uh, exam pressures and it's a key, a key time for, for that sort of a lesson so she's going to come and speak to us on that. And we'll be meeting every fortnightly or so uh, and preparing then for Summer Madness uh, towards the end of June. Also our Sunday evening service is going to be on on the 15th of May also. So. Uh, come along and join us for that. That's 6 p.m. here in the parish centre. Uh, Stanley Kai of our Word Ministries uh, will be with us that evening to speak. Uh, so please come along and invite a friend. Julie will be there involved as well also. But keep that date in your diary, please. And invite someone along uh, to this fellowship. Why not invite a friend? Also important to remember that Tommy, Tom Moody, our Gordon here is running today. Is it as we speak or not? It is as we speak. <laughs> so he is uh, doing the Belfast Marathon for uh, our board ministries to raise money for that. So there's still a sponsorship form at the back uh, if you want to sponsor Tom uh, and our board ministries pioneers. Uh, that would be great. Uh, Julie also had a few, there's a few uh, wee leaflets at the back for a couple of resources that uh, Julie has been, uh, wants to encourage us. There's a Women's Study Fellowship that's available at uh, Belfast Bible College. That will be on Monday morning. So if anybody's interested in doing that uh, over 11 weeks, I think it is, um, there's a wee leaflet at the back with information in it. If you're interested in getting into that, you're free on Monday mornings, why not? And also uh, over the summer up at uh, New Horizon on the north coast, if you're up there, Coleraine Direction, between the 6th and 12th of uh, August, there's a Renewed Minds uh, week course uh, that is happening, or we're Bible teaching and worship and fellowship together. So there's a couple of wee leaflets there just beside the back door, uh, like this. Lift them uh, if you're interested, and uh, sure, that might be a good thing to come along to. Uh, Lift is on again tomorrow evening. They're meeting uh, in the Paris Hall. Uh, is that 7.30, Heather, isn't it? Uh, Heather's going to come up now and just say a few words about that meeting. It's just Heather and Anne as well. The team are coming. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, ladies, Jenny, Anne, and myself invite you all to our lift meeting tomorrow night, Monday, the 2nd of May at 7.30 in the church hall. The theme for the evening is a right royal night out, a celebration of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's platinum anniversary year. We've got lots of royal fun planned, plus a most esteemed visitor will hopefully be making an appearance. We would invite you to bring along any memorabilia you have Queen Elizabeth to display on our table for everyone to have a look at. Looking forward to a night of fellowship together. I now invite Anne Forward who is going to give an update on our forthcoming trip. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I just want to give a few details about our um, outing which is on Friday the 27th of May to Christchurch Flower Festival in Castle Rock. Um, I've left the sheet at the back of the hall. If there's any ladies who still would like to join us, please add your name and you're very, very welcome. This year we are traveling on the train and hopefully, uh, all being well, we'll be traveling on the 11 o'clock train, either from Ballymena or Kalabaki, whichever is convenient to you ladies to get on, the, the, you know, whatever is convenient to you. Um, also, if anybody needs a lift to the train station, please ask Jenny, speak to Jenny, Heather or myself, and we will ensure that you get a lift there. 
Um, when we arrive and after the, we go around the Flower Festival, we are booked into Castle Rock Golf Club uh, around 2.15 for a two-course meal, dinner and dessert, and the cost of that is £16. Um, also, we've also got a copy of the menu so we can pre-order all our, our, our food and uh, those who will come tomorrow night will have that opportunity to choose what they want to eat and any dietary requirements. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you for your patience and look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thank you, Anne and Heather. Uh, one last wee announcement, and there's another slide there, I think, Jack. Might come up. No. No joy? We read that we, so we had our Easter general vestry uh, this week, and we have voted in now our new vestry members. Uh, so that is who you go to uh, if you have any problems or any issues. Uh, just to, don't to come to me, come to these guys first. Um, could the vestry, I'm just going to ask you now to select vestry, just stand up if you are, if your name's there for a moment, uh, just so everyone can see who you are. Uh, as I say, these are the folks now that are uh, in our vestry for the year ahead, and we are to look after this church uh, and guide this church uh, uh, going forward, but we need help. Uh, we need God's help, and we need his direction, and we need your prayer. So I'm going to invite us all now uh, just to bow our heads, and we'll pray for our select vestry going forward. Lord God, uh, we want to give you thanks for the commitment of those standing who uh, are willing to give their time and resources and energy, Lord, into the smooth running of this church. And we do that, Lord, for you. We do that for your kingdom. Uh, we pray, Lord God, that you guide all the select vestry members as they meet together, as they, uh, they tackle difficult issues, as they make decisions, Lord. May they be godly decisions. May you guide us all uh, in a peaceful way and a harmonious way, Lord. And may your kingdom grow out of how this church is governed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Take a seat again. And as long as you know their faces, then you can come to them first. Don't be any bother. Folks, we are, as we always do every Sunday, when we meet together, we remember, we remind ourselves that we, as individuals, fall short and we need God's forgiveness in this life. In this Easter season, we bring our fears today and our feelings uh, to the risen Christ. That's what we're doing. So if these words appear on screen, uh, we will follow them together. So Lord, we ask forgiveness for when we are faced with difficulties and challenges, but we end up reverting to our old sinful attitudes. For this we say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, for when we allow past hurts to damage our current relationships, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, when we face difficult times, but we fail to trust in your loving purposes, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, for when we so always seem to just look inwards to our own selfish concerns rather than outwards to a world in need, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. When we are agents of gloom rather than messengers of hope, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy upon each one of us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen our heads and pray together the collect for today the third Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father who in your great mercy gladden the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ your son our Lord. With that now, I'm going to invite George up, who's going to lead our children's talk this morning. Thanks, George. Thank you. Just over a week ago, uh, Jennifer and myself had the opportunity to go up to Derry to the official opening in the Guild Hall of the exhibition, Our Space, Our Place in Space. <laughs> now, for all the young people here, I would recommend to you that you go to see that. It is going to be in Derry, that's 
the copper on the brochure. It's going to be in Derry for a month. Then it's come to Belfast for a month. It goes to Cambridge. Don't think you're going to see it there. And then it comes back to the North Down Coast for a month. And really what it is, it's about our entire solar system. And the thing is entitled, bringing our solar system down to Earth. Now that's quite a, a complicated idea, isn't it? Actually, we've discovered it's very, very complicated for adults, but children don't seem to have too much problem with it. You're better at these things than us. So they've got some very clever and very technical people in here to help work this out. They have Oliver Jeffers, the artist, and Dr. Stephen Short, who is the Professor of Astrophysics at Queen's. Now, Jack, if we could have the first slide there, please, to see. That's the two chaps there, and you can, I think you can guess which one's the artist. <laughs> and which one's the astrophysicist. So they gave a talk that night about our solar system and the entire universe. Uh, and it was, they were helped by another lady you might see in television. The next slide, Jack. Oh, yes, might be quite large there. A large lady, in more ways than one. If you could take that lady in Butler, she would solve the world's energy problems. She is so animated. That's Dr. Maggie Adjuran Pocock, that you might see on television occasionally. So they had this grand opening about bringing our solar system down to Earth. And they, had, they launched it, and you might have seen this on television. They wanted to see how many astronauts they could get in one place at one time. So everybody there dressed up. Is there a picture, Jack, of that? And they've set a world record, which the Guinness Book of Records has acknowledged. 700 and something astronauts fully kitted out in one place at one time. There's a generational gap here. I think it's incredible. Any young person here know who that chap in the orange space suit is? Anybody know? Adults probably not, but that's Adam B. Anybody know him? Yes, we have a young hand going up. He's a YouTuber with 12 million followers. Young lad from Derry. Talks all about his younger brother. If you want to get out and to get your message known, send it to him. For £15,000, he'll put a link onto his site. And you'll get 12 million followers straight away. So not, not an adult knew who he was, but all the children did. So what they have done up at Derry, and they'll bring it to Belfast, they have created our entire solar system and they brought it down to scale, a scale of 591 million to one. And they formed it in art form out around the banks of the foil. And they would explain why they did that. Jack, could you play the little uh, video, please? That's the artist. Sorry. I'm Stephen Smart, and I'm an astrophysicist. For centuries, we humans have defined ourselves by who we are and who we're not. <laughs> by which side we support, by where we stand, by who and what we fight for, by what we believe. Quite simply, we divide ourselves into us and them. And all too often, we get entirely hung up on these labels. Coming from Northern Ireland, we know all about this. I lived in New York City now for the last 15 years, and with distance comes perspective. But how much distance? Uh, what's your but that's to New York. If you go straight up, the International Space Station is 240 miles away. And from there, astronauts begin to experience the overview effect, where it's just obvious that our planet is one giant single system. To the moon, it's nearly a quarter of a million miles. And only 12 people have ever made it that far and stood on the moon. From there, you can't actually see anything man-made at all. If we go even further, our nearest planet, Venus, it's 26 million miles, and Venus is about the size of the Earth. Hold on, our nearest planet is 26 million miles away? Yeah, that's right. What about the furthest planet? Well, that's Neptune. That's about 2.6 billion miles. I thought Pluto was the furthest planet. Well, it's a dwarf planet. <laughs> sort of don't count it anymore. But to get to the edge of the solar system, you need to travel 9 billion miles. It's kind of hard to comprehend just how much space there is in space. It's almost impossible to have a scale model of our solar system. If Earth were the size of a ping pong ball, the moon would be the size of a pea. About a meter distance. 
Broken. On this scale, the furthest planet, Neptune, would be about the size of a small melon. I happen to have one right here. <laughs> and how far away would this be? About eight miles. Eight miles, okay. So what would happen if we could view ourselves alone on a tiny planet, the only one that can harbor life from the far reaches of our solar system? Well, we intend to find out. And our prediction is, with enough distance, us and them simply become Jack. That's the message they're trying to bring across. If you go up and walk it, the walk is 10 kilometers. Curtis, you'd be interested. I've seen you running about. You're quite quick. Now, I don't want you to run, but if you go there and you walk around it at normal speed, you're, you will be going at one and a half times the speed of light. So you'll be really shifting to get around it. And everything is scale, and you can see our entire solar system in scale at one time. But the whole point of it is what those 12 astronauts who stood in the moon all said. There's no us and them. There's only us. We are so incredibly small in the entire universe. We have to look after this place. There's no Catholic, no Protestant, no Black, no White, no Muslim, no Christian. We're all in this tiny little rock. And one thing they were agreed on, lots of things they didn't agree on, this is the only place we can live. There's nowhere else where we can stay. So we're on this small rock. They were trying to give an example. How, how big is the universe? And there will be a great project here for Amanda and Stephen and Elaine and all the Sunday school. What I would like you to do this summer, if you could all go up to Port Stewart Strand, when the tide is out, and I would love for all you young people to go out and count all the grains of sand <laughs> on Port Stewart Strand. And the teachers will help you. <laughs> and come back and tell me how many grains of sand are on Port Stewart Strand. How do you think that would compare to the number of stars and planets out there? Would there be more grains of sand or more planets? What do you think? Yes, Curtis, do you want to go? Sorry? I didn't hear you. There's more planets. You are absolutely correct. In fact, there are more planets out there and suns than there are grains of sand on the our entire planet. Never mind Port Stewart. There's an staggering number. So that little project will tell you just how many things are out there. Today's reading is in John. It's further on in John. But in the first chapter, it reminds us of the Word and who made the Word. It was fascinating in that talk, the people who asked the most intelligent questions were the children. Some little child asked, how far away is the furthest planet? And there's great excitement because they've discovered it only two weeks ago apparently. It's 22 billion light years away. They said it might not exist anymore. But the light keeps travelling and we remember John. In the beginning was the Word. Through him all things were made. The entire world was made. We call Jesus the light of the world. And it says that the light was there in the darkness comprehended it not. It couldn't swallow it up. So like that star, which might not be there anymore, the light still comes to us. Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, just over it. He left us an example. They then killed him. But his light still shines. He may be dead on earth, but the light still comes to us. Like that star from so far away, it still gets to us. So there's an example here for all of us to try and make our light shine to others long after we're gone. There's only us, there's no them. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, George. I'm going to invite uh, Heather up now for... No, I'm not going to do that just yet, Heather. Michael, you're going to play, and our children are going to continue worship down the road in Sunday school. of our Saviour Christ according to John chapter 21 beginning at verse 1. Afterwards Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we can go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish in it, and some fish. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, Son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. 
Then he said to him, Follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, uh, we give you thanks for your word, uh, the truth of your word. We thank you that it is there for us to read, to absorb, to live from. So Lord, we ask that you are with us today with the freedom we enjoy to meet together without fear. Lord, be with us. Holy Spirit, guide us, prompt us in our hearts. Put us on the right path. Help us follow you with sincere hearts. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we uh, continue our journey alongside the disciples as Jesus, as the risen Jesus. He is alive as he appears to his closest disciples. But he does so, we're told, for the third time here. So what is the setting of this appearance, this uh, unveiling? Well, it's fishing. Uh, I don't know, most of us probably put the first slide up there, Jack. The most of us, we think about fishing as a, as a hobby, uh, a very frustrating hobby. Some of us call it a sport. Uh, I fished as a young teenager, uh, and I did it without a license, I'm afraid to say. And I had to borrow somebody else's rod, and I did the fish for about a year and a half. And then my mum bought my own license for my birthday and a new rod, and then I stopped fishing. <laughs> to my shame. Maybe the thrill was gone, you know, if it wasn't, it wasn't illegal anymore, you know. Or maybe just in a year and a half, I caught absolutely nothing. I had caught nothing in a year and a half fishing. It was good fun at times with my mates, but uh, I didn't catch anything. But to many of us, it's a hobby. In certain areas around the world and, and, and on the coast here as well, it's a real profession. It's a hard job. It is something that people earn their livings doing. And to these disciples... It is and always was their profession. And at this point in John's Gospel that Heather read for us, uh, they are doing what they, they do best, at least what they think they do best, and that's fishing. They're fishing. Back to porridge for Peter. Simon says in verse 3, next slide there, Jack. I'm going fishing. He sounds like he's had enough. He doesn't know what to do with himself. I'm going fishing. They said to him, I don't know whether some husbands walk out of the house like that sometimes. Go to the guards and get the fishing kit. I'm going fishing, he said. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Something I'm familiar with, they caught nothing. Now when you think about it, this is probably the first time that Peter and his fishing buddies have gone fishing since the last time. When was the last time they were fishing? Well, you remember fishing is what Simon Peter and his brothers were doing when Jesus approached them. This was at the very start of Jesus' ministry. They were fishing, they were plying their trade. So between these two fishing expeditions, uh, a lot has happened. Specifically, Jesus has happened. And he's turned their world upside down. We can just go back to that first encounter in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. That's why they did it then, that's why they're doing it now, they're fishermen. Verse 19, and he said to them, look for these two key words, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And in the next verse, you'll read it if it's in front of you. Immediately they left their nets and followed him in verse 20. If you know this passage, the wonder is often in their immediate response. They just drop their nets and go. Jesus says, follow me. Be fishers of men and they follow. Just hold that thought. I just have to say, it's kind of cool, isn't it? Don't you think that Jesus chose to come back to these guys, appear to these guys, after all that they've been through, one of the last times he'll be with them, he appears to them the same way he appeared to them the first time. 
I happen to think Jesus is the coolest man on the planet. Why shouldn't he be? Why wouldn't he be? He's God. So anyway, perhaps knowing, not knowing what else to do, these guys go fishing and they catch nothing. And then, just next slide again, Jack. And then Jesus reveals himself to them and says, the way he puts it in verse 1, after this empty expedition, as the day is breaking, as dawn is breaking, he stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it to be Jesus. They couldn't see him. 100 yards, just maybe from here to the back of the church, and the sun's up, and they maybe don't know who it is, can't make it out who it was. And Jesus shouts, Children, do you have any fish? You can follow in verses 5 and 7. Any fish? No, they reply. Lower your net on the other side. And they do so. And there is so much fish, they can't even haul it in. I remember listening to Desi Maxwell, you maybe all know Desi from this part of the woods, talking with this verse, this passage, and saying that actually Jesus might have just been able to see a big grey patch of fish on the other side of the boat, and he says, throw it on the other side from where he was standing. But I happen to think it was definitely a miracle, a miraculous cast of fish. And it's very similar to Luke's telling of that same moment that I talked about Jesus first calls his disciples in Luke's version, Luke 5, the details are added that they toil all through the night for nothing. Again, same thing. And then Jesus appears and asks them to put down their nets again and they catch a large number of fish. The nets are bursting in Luke 5's version. In this version, verse 7, John says to Peter, it is the Lord. Peter heard it and he dives into the sea and he swims a hundred yards from here to the back of church whilst the disciples follow behind with their big haul. Peter dives in and swims a hundred yards to be with Jesus. This passage is written by John but in many ways it's about Peter. As they all get to the shore there's a charcoal fire there in place. Jesus says, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Verse 13, come and have breakfast. We're told that they knew it was the Lord. And then verse 14 confirms that this has been the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples he was raised from the dead. Why do I say it's about Peter? Well, the disciple Peter, who didn't recognize Jesus at first, jumps in, swims to him, gets there first. He wins the race, shows the others, I'm first there. And he is the one whom Jesus, after finishing eating, does business with. Notice this. Jesus said to Peter, Simon Peter, next verse there, Jack. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It's a bit like he said, yes, of course, Lord. Did you not see me jump in and swim to you there? Like a bullet in a rush. The others didn't do that. You know that I love you. I am the keenest. Jesus replies, feed my lambs. And he doesn't leave it at that. He asks them three times. We all know how special the number three is here with Peter. We all know and remember how many times Peter denied Jesus during his trial. That was three times. Three times that the answer to do you love me, you could say was a very clear and resounding no. I don't love you. I couldn't even admit it, admit that I knew you during your trial. Jesus asked again a second question. Simon Son of John, do you love me? And again he replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, tend my sheep. And then a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love you, me? Peter is grieved. Grieved at being asked a third time, can you imagine yourself, are we second standing before the Lord Jesus and him asking you these four words, do you love me? 
three times. I think after the second time I've been the floor. Do you love me? He asks. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, says Jesus. One thing that seems to be apparent in this exchange between Jesus and Peter is that loving Jesus seems to be more about how we treat his sheep than how quicker we are to run to him, dive in, rush to him than others. My mind was drawn immediately to this idea, oh, if the Church of Christ was more concerned about caring for, feeding, tending, encouraging each other, like I talked about at our Easter General Vestry, if the Church of Jesus Christ is more about helping each other, encouraging one another, reaching out to one another, about introducing others to him, than trying to just show how holy we are, compared to the one beside us. What a church it would be. What a place it would be to be part of. How do we show our love of God? How do we show our love and our dedication to Jesus? We care for his sheep. We feed his lambs. We tend. We feed his sheep. Jesus has just fed these guys. He's created and allowed this miraculous catch and, the, and they feasted on it, no doubt, this morning and, he, and it would have been a joyful encounter with Jesus. And he says, now go and feed my people. Jesus, the last time he approached them in their boats, said, follow me and be fishers of men. Now he is with them again and he says, follow me. Notice that Peter is diving in, rushing to Jesus and leaving the catch behind. The large hall. Jesus warns Peter here, do you love me? Then care for my sheep. And then he warns that it will not end well in a worldly sense for Peter. It's important that we focus on that. It's here. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, he said to Peter, and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. And it even explains for us in verse 19, this he said to show of what kind of death he was to glorify God. I don't know what feeding you get spiritually outside of this church fellowship. For many of you, I don't know what books you read at home and what, who, you, who you watch on YouTube or something like that. I don't know those things in many cases. But if any of you read, there was a book out called Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. If any of you read that and was influenced by that, or if any of you are fans of Joyce Myers, have read or seen those books, or if any of you listen to people like Joel Austin, they will all say that you are entitled to a joyful, prosperous life if you follow Jesus. Commit to him and he will pour your blessings upon you, health and wealth. That message doesn't suit Peter here. Jesus says to Peter, if you love me, serve. If you love me, serve. There's so much of what is fed called Christianity out there, evangelical Christianity, and it's all really about you. Here's what you can get out of this deal. Here's how you can prosper and thrive. It's nothing to do with serving. Jesus was Peter was asked three times here. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, serve. Peter, if you love me, then work out your transformed life as a follower of Jesus by caring for others, feeding my sheep. Sacrifice for me in this way. 
turns out that you will have an uncomfortable end. Tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down by Nero in the end. And after Jesus said, follow me. Before I start to sound smug, I am truly convicted by this exchange between Peter and Jesus. Because all I have to do is put my name at the front of that question. Dennis, do you love me? And I can hear myself like Peter say, of course, Lord. And maybe, sure, you, you, know, you know I do this and I do that and it'll do. And then I hear him asking me again, Dennis, do you love me? And I hear myself go quiet. And reading this passage, I say, oh, Jesus, am I feeding your sheep? Am I tending your sheep? Am I caring for, encouraging your people in the faith? Am I reaching out enough to those in my life, those whom I meet with your good news, with compassion? Or am I simply saying, oh, I'm all right, Lord, sure, I believe in you. I'll pray to you, you'll keep me right. Sure, that's the deal. If something goes wrong in my life, if I lose someone, if I get ill, I'll pray all the harder and you'll help me. You'll get me through that. I'll have a happy ending on this earth. Am I simply and plainly worrying about myself and my relationship with the Lord? Is my faith all about self-service? That's why all those ministries I've talked about have churches where there's thousands. Can't get into the place. Is my faith all about self-service and not about serving others? Jesus asked the question. If you remember one thing this morning, remember Jesus is the type to ask of his disciples, here, do you love me? And the proof of the pudding seems to be our willingness to serve, to feed, to care, to love, to encourage, to tend one another. Just put your name in front, in front of that question from Jesus this morning and ask yourself, is my faith about self-service? There's my faith about serving others in his name. Let me pray. Lord God. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for uh, all that he offers and does for us. But Lord, we are commanded by him to follow him. And following him means something. It means we have to let go of stuff. It means we have to recalibrate our own hearts and lives every day. We have to put Jesus at the center before all our own desires. And we have to serve and love and care for his people. Lord, may we know that that is what real love is in Jesus' eyes. And may we live it out, strive to at least. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We switched our order about a little bit this morning. I'm going to encourage you now to stand to sing uh, our next hymn together. We're all going to sing together, Tethered to the Cross.
Please be seated. Our response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, as we think upon your disciples in those moments, those encounters when Jesus rose and appeared to them, we pray for all those who, like the disciples at that time, were and are confused in their faith and despondent about life. Grant, Lord, that we may encourage each other on the journey of faith and know Christ's presence as we learn from the scriptures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, also for all those who have recently discovered the reality of the risen Christ, those whose hearts have rang true with his words, have seen the Lord God Almighty in him. Lord, help them grow in the faith, Lord, guide us in all who we have access to, whose faith is at a low ebb, Lord. Help us, encourage them. May they grow in faith and knowledge of you. We ask, Lord, that you strengthen the whole church. We pray for our Bishop, Bishop George, and all who minister to nourish faith through sound teaching, through spiritual worship, through pastoral care. Lord, in your mercy, here on earth. We pray for those who are experiencing the horrors of war at this time, persecution, lonely exile from their homeland. We think especially, Lord, for Ukraine and all the people who have been misplaced, the lives that have been lost. Lord, we ask that you bring peace to that land thwart the plans of evil people. Lord, we ask that you guide all governments, we ask that you guide our Queen and all who lead in the nations of this world. Help them, Lord, to create conditions for peace and for justice to flourish and for your kingdom to grow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the church when, as the first disciples find it, its efforts to evangelize seemed fruitless and numbers were low. Lord, we ask that you inspire us all to reach out to others, to find new ways of proclaiming the gospel in today's culture. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for the church leaders when, like Peter, they suffer personal failure, criticism, or a loss of self-confidence. Uphold them, Lord. Guide them. Give them strength. Renew their response to Christ's call to feed his flock. And strengthen us all, Lord, to work together in the church's ministry. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Amen. And Lord, we finally pray, we remember all those who suffer from ill health at this time, or who are coping with disability. Remember all those who have died and those who mourn, loved ones. Lord God, keep hope alive when the burdens of life grow heavy, and may they turn to you in their most difficult times. Lord, have mercy. Father God, we give you thanks for all you have given us and we ask all these prayers in the name of your Son, our Saviour, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come now to share our Holy Communion together. And we begin that by sharing and praying together. And we do not presume. We do not presume to come to this. It's not up yet, no. 
the prayer of humble access which we will say together now beginning we do not presume we do not presume to come to this your table merciful lord trusting in our own righteousness but in your manifold and great mercies we are not worthy so much as to gather the crumbs under your table but you are the same lord whose nature is always to have mercy grant us therefore gracious lord so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Just take a wee moment to share the peace and say hello to someone alongside you who has spoken to you. Wise and gracious God, you spread a table before us. We ask that you nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Invite us all to stand. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Father, almighty and ever-living God, at all times and in all places, it is right to give you thanks and to give you praise. And so with all your people, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Father, the creator and sustainer of all things. You made us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. Even when we turned away from you, you never ceased to care for us. But in your love and your mercy, you freed us from the slavery of sin. Giving your only begotten Son to become man and suffer death on the cross to redeem us. He made there the one complete and all sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his most precious death until he comes again. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup we do, as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension. And we look for the coming of his kingdom. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, grant by the power of the life-giving spirit, that we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your Son, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And we share together now the prayer that Jesus taught us beginning, Our Father in Heaven. Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We be many our own body, for we all share in the one bread. I invite you now to draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Remember that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. is again available in from the one cup if you want to come forward for that or with the small fellowship cups where you can remain seated that's perfectly fine either way.
thee, preserve thy body and soul and everlasting life. I can eat this in remembrance of Christ. Thy for thee and be faithful. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul and everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance of Christ's blood was shed for thee and be thankful. post-communion prayer for this Sunday, the third Sunday of Easter. Living God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. say together, Almighty God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. We stand again to worship God and sing our closing hymn, O Lord my God.
short prayer as we stand. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, may we be strengthened to walk with Jesus. May each of us be strengthened to look out for his sheep and to follow him in his risen life. In his name, name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.